Um, next talk is going to be uh, by Elizabeth Herrera. This is one of her favorite topics, uh, hypertrophic <laughs> cardiomyopathy. Okay, uh, this uh, is actually, yes, one of my favorite topics because it has been changing a lot with new imaging uh, techniques and um, actually the nomenclature uh, has also changed since even you all probably started uh, residency. So the prior nomenclature uh, has been idiopathic hypertrophic subaortic stenosis, also HOCUM, uh, many of you know it as this, hypertrophic obstructive cardiomyopathy. It's also been called asymmetrical septal cardiomyopathy and dynamic muscular subaortic stenosis. But right now, uh, the uh, nomenclature that we know all these uh, diseases that were previously called different things is called HCM, hypertrophic cardiomyopathy. Oh, also familial myocardial disease because it is genetic. Uh, so uh, this actually is the most common genetic cardiovascular disease. Uh, the incidence is uh, been found in uh, up to one in 200 uh, of patients, uh, people in the population. I think it is increasingly being diagnosed. That's why uh, the incidence looks like it's uh, going up. It's autosomal dominant, and it also has variable penetrance. Uh, which means uh, uh, the only thing in common that it, they, people have is that they have some form of asymmetry. They all have some form of asymmetry in their uh, hypertrophy with non-dilated ventricular chambers. And uh, the important thing is you can diagnose this condition in patients who present from, for other procedures just because you're putting an echo in. So uh, the majority of these patients, even with LVOT obstruction, have no symptoms. Uh, but if they do have symptoms, the, uh, uh, they can be very devastating. They can have dizziness, syncope, angina, and they also can present just uh, with no symptoms and just sudden cardiac death. Uh, eventually, uh, long term, they can eventually have uh, uh, congestive heart failure, AFib fibrosis, and end stage heart failure from the affected sarcomeres. So this is what you have to fill out if you have a kid before they go to school every year. And uh, that's because of uh, this uh, sudden cardiac arrest in athletes. So this is a uh, major problem. Uh, that's why there's so much screening before your kid participates in sports. And there are still some people who uh, do uh, ha uh, um, die from sudden cardiac arrest uh, in the uh, athlete world. Uh, so basically, hypertrophic cardiomyopathy is a disease of the myocardial muscle fiber or sarcomere. These, uh, these fibers are enlarged and abnormally shaped, so uh, this interferes with not only the normal generation of myocardial uh, force and ejection, they all, uh, also interferes with myocardial relaxation, okay? It's like, you know, bl building blocks. You can't put them together if they're not shaped normally. Um, so, and also, uh, fibrosis occurs because both of um, abnormal cell metabolism and also um, uh, th that from the uh, collagen and also from uh, just uh, um, uh, uh, anatomical uh, problems. So these are photomicrographs of a patient we have uh, that um, were stained with a before and after a staining, a trichrome stain, and the blue shows the fib uh, the light blue shows the fibrosis, notably at the edges and uh, also interstitial. So these are different patterns of LV uh, hypertrophy by cardiac MRI. Uh, you can see uh, the first one shows apical, uh, where is it? There, cardiomyopathy. Uh, here is basal. That's basal and apical cardiomyopathy, and this is basal and mid-cavitary, and the apex here is pretty clean. So there can be uh, multiple patterns uh, of uh, the location, and that is just because there's a variable phenotypic expression. Not one of these is uh, alike. Also, you can call it, uh, it's been called by different geometric shapes, the first one being the sigmoid S. There is a reverse a reverse curve of that here, uh, here, and a neutral here. 
So this also shows the variable phenotypic expression. Uh, also, these people can have accessory papillary muscles that sometimes can be best uh, seen only in uh, cardiac MRI. Um, and you can see uh, one is a view uh, long axis in diastole, long axis in systole, where you can barely see anything in the uh, myocardial chamber, and the short axis view in diastole, where you can actually see this specific, uh, there's three of them, there's like four of them here. So uh, one uh, way we can actually see the myocardial fibrosis, which is a hallmark of hypertrophic cardiomyopathy, is look at the uh, late gadolinium enhancement, and that's only by cardiac CMR. Uh, and you can really see that there is either um, uh, there is uh, in interstitial fibrosis and also it can be on the outside. And so there's primary and secondary fibrosis. Um, and the arrows here point to the white, which is the fibrosis. So the factors associated with a worse uh, prognosis, including a risk of sudden cardiac death, is a wall thickness in diastole of, of three centimeters or greater, uh, resting peak LV, uh, LVOT peak rating of 30 millimeters or higher, uh, interstitial fibrosis, uh, which the presence of interstitial fibrosis, which means that there are microvascular abnormalities, and these uh, abnormalities can uh, lead to ischemia. Also, focal fibrosis that results from chronic LVOT obstruction. So here, the dotted white line uh, points to the uh, thickness of the, obviously this is in diastole because the mitral valve is open. Here is this large uh, uh, interventricular septum that it measures over three centimeters. And the blue line here points to the um, white uh, border of that septum that is actually fibrosis. Uh, it has a hypertrophic cardiomyopathy has a characteristic spectral Doppler pattern that has been uh, referred to as a late peaking dagger shaped pattern because the highest velocities occur in mid to late systole while the ventricle is contracting because this is a dynamic obstruction. This is a patient who uh, we did, uh, this is their uh, intraoperative five uh, uh, TEE metesophageal five chamber, the arrow, white arrow points to the fibrosis and this is a specimen that the surgeon resected. Uh, it actually, that fibrosis can guide, the presence of that white fibrosis can guide the surgeon for where, uh, you know, he, how the, exte the uh, extent he can make his um, incision. So um, septomyectomy is actually a class one indication for patients who have, and de definitive therapy gold standard for patients who have hypertrophic cardiomyopathy who fail medical management and are high risk for um, sudden cardiac death. There is not many one class one indications in surgery. This is one of them, okay? But the caveat for that, read this here. This is from the ACC AHA guidelines. It should be performed only by experienced operators in the context of a comprehensive clinical program. And experienced operators are defined as an individual operator who has a cumulative case volume of at least 20 procedures or an individual operator working in a dedicated HOCAM program with a cumulative total at least 50. There's not very many people out there, um, I mean, not many people, not many procedures out there who actually have this kind of uh, warning black label box, okay? In Texas, we have no uh, certificate of need. You can open a, a cardiac program anywhere you want, doesn't matter. You can go anywhere start doing cabs. This is something that, um, that is very important to obey, you know, these guidelines. So preoperative considerations for anesthesiologists, we, uh, you know, always are, uh, take a history. You always want to know if there actually is a history of sudden cardiac death or in the patient's family. Uh, syncope, AFib, heart failure, previous alcohol ablation, that used to be um, in vogue for this. Autonomic dysfunction or concomitant uh, coronary artery disease or importantly, any contraindication to putting in an echo probe. That's so important to ask because you never know uh, with these patients. And uh, this is a very um, uh, uh, important technique, uh, transesophageal echocardiography, in determining uh, the nature and extent of the disease and the postoperative um, you know, uh, success. So you need to know if you can put a probe in or not. 
Uh, so these are the pre-op studies. If, you, if they have right bundle branch block, they're most likely, more likely to develop heart block. That's because, as uh, we learned earlier, the aortomitral curtain underneath that uh, and the trigones, um, that uh, is where the bundle of his is. Uh, you want to look at the echo distribution of hokum, the systolic and diastolic uh, ventricular function, any problem with the valves, uh, with their gradients, and assess the ascending aorta. Uh, on the CMR, you can look at the anatomy, the fibrosis. Also, there can be intramural coronary arteries. Um, we learned earlier about the uh, um, coronary arteries and uh, their, you know, uh, variants, and also they can have uh, they can be involved with the fibrosis, and on the cath, you can see a characteristic milking pattern. Um, also on cardiac comp uh, cath, you can see dynamic compression. So associated procedures these patients come in for, the surgeon has to be able to uh, know how to do all these other things because while they're in the operating room, they can get all this other stuff. So they need to be able to know how to do a mitral valve repair, coronary artery bypass, a maze procedure with uh, potential left atrial penetration section and uh, ventricular leads and pacemakers that might have to be done as well. Um, so this is a patient with a 56-year-old male with uh, hypertrophic cardiomyopathy, MR, and ischemic heart disease. And you can see that uh, basically right here is your uh, hypertrophic cardiomyopathy. Uh, and um, here you see uh, the classic um, LVOT uh, during systole. Uh, acceleration of flow, but you also see two jets of MR in the left atrium. You see one big jet here, and you see one small jet here. So what is that? So uh, you knew this was coming to vector flow mapping. Uh, so this is uh, vector flow mapping and how we get systolic anterior motion. It's actually drag. So um, what happens is the vort, the, the, uh, uh, this is normal up here, and this is hypertrophic cardiomyopathy. So this septum bulges and pushes blood towards uh, the lateral wall. And so that creates uh, more blood flow coming here and causes this to come anteriorly, obstructing the LVOT. And so the position of the uh, jet is um, it results from both isovolemic vortical flow, that's before contraction, and then uh, during contraction, the left ventricle ejection of flow. And the direction is posteriorly and laterally, meaning that the MR jet goes, uh, is in uh, mid to late systole and posterior and laterally. So basically, this is the SAM jet. This is something else. Okay, here we go. So this is, um, we did a myectomy, we did a mitral valve repair, and a cab times two in this patient. And you can see uh, this is a dynamic uh, situation, and you can see here in his uh, uh, LVOT, uh, the uh, bulging uh, septum is, has been resected. Uh, that there is no systolic uh, anterior motion of the mitral valve, and there's also no um, uh, uh, flail posterior leaflet. And the leaflets are coming down with systole and not uh, coming up. And there's no uh, color flow Doppler showing uh, any residual MR. So basically, that's what you look at. You look for residual LVOT obstruction, residual MR, you look for leaflet and chordal function, SAM, a prolapse flail, LVOT gradient you can do, and uh, importantly, a VSD. You could potentially get a VSD. Uh, and here, again, is another example of the fibrosis. A patient, uh, okay, so basically there's two surgical approaches. One is trans, trans aortic, which is for most of them, and that is um, if you have a patient who has like a basal hypertrophy, and the surgeon makes an incision just like, much like doing an aortic valve replacement um, to resect and goes through the delicate aortic leaflets uh, and, and goes from there, takes a knife. Uh, or it could be transapical, and this is an unfortunate patient who had mid cavitary obstruction. Right here is the, the uh, this is the, um, uh, 
so this is uh, a long axis, transgastric long axis view. Here is your hypertrophic cardiomyopathy. Here is your mitral valve up here. Down here is a, your basic, and she had a, a, uh, a apical aneurysm. Uh, with this kind of uh, flow pattern, uh, that here is the most narrowest point, was here. It was not in the LVOT, it's right here in the ventricle. Okay, so what we did was a resection of the apical aneurysm and a septal myectomy. This is supposed to play, but don't worry about it. So uh, right here, you can see the, um, the whitish tissue here. That's what he put in there as a Gore-Tex patch. And then he resected all this. And um, if it could play, it would show you that um, it actually, there was no more, yeah, there we go. So there's no more, uh, that was pretty an amazing repair, I have to say. So in conclusion, uh, hokum uh, or hypertrophic cardiomyopathy is being more commonly diagnosed as imaging procedures become more ubiquitous. There was actually a study showing that medical students could do um, uh, surface ultrasound to uh, screen these patients, and they got the same results as a pediatric cardiologist. Um, and uh, <laughs> so uh, also uh, the gold standard for treatment is surgical myectomy by an experienced cardiac surgeon, and that preoperative imaging, including CMR, is essential to diagnosis and management. Thank you very much.